Hello and welcome to this weekend's service. My name is Andrew Philbeck and I am in charge of groups here at Mount Pleasant. I'm sure many of you are like me and you're still adjusting to the ever-changing events that are going on in our world right now. Uh, during all of this that is happening, though, I'm glad that you're taking some time to be with us uh, during our journey through the, math, uh, through the Gospel of Matthew. Rather, uh, Last week, my dad preached a message called Characters of the Cross, and if you uh, haven't already listened to it, I would encourage you to do that as soon as you can. But if you were with us last week, if you did watch that message, then you know it was the beginning of a two-part message. Uh, but I'm not going to be bringing you part two in our time together. And the reason is because what my dad is doing is looking at both the individual people and the groups of people that surrounded Jesus during his crucifixion. And he broke them up into two categories. Basically, he's looking at, or he already looked at, the people around Jesus before his crucifixion. And then next week, we're going to talk about the people who were around Jesus during and after his crucifixion. And because of that, what we need to do today is spend time talking about the crucifixion itself. And so that's what I'm going to do. Now, there are many stories in the Bible that people are familiar with, even people who have never gone to church before. People all over the world know or at least are familiar with the stories like Noah and the Ark and David and Goliath and the walls of Jericho crashing down. And of course, those are just a few easy examples. Now, there are more to be sure. But perhaps no story is as familiar as the story of Jesus hanging on a cross. We see examples of that all over in our world, from movies to TV shows, literature, music, painting, sculptures. There's references to it in just about every aspect of our lives. And the reason I say that is because it can be easy at times, if we aren't careful, to let something that we are familiar with lose its impact in our lives. And we all know that this is true. We take things, even people, for granted at times. And it's not because they don't matter. It's not because they don't have value. It's just because we have grown so used to them. So what I want to challenge you to do during our time together is to listen to the story of the crucifixion as best you can with fresh ears and to read it with fresh eyes that you might notice things that you have never noticed before or that you might be moved by something in a new and a different way. Our text uh, this weekend is Matthew 27, verses 27 through 56. You can go ahead and turn there if you want and just hold your place. Uh, our text itself is a little misleading. And what I mean when I say that, though, is uh, I'm not going to read and I'm not going to talk about every single thing in this entire passage from start to finish. And the reason is because next week, when we finish up that Characters of the Cross sermon, uh, we're going to see that some of their stories are also found in this passage. And so I'm not going to talk about them today. I'm going to focus primarily on Jesus. And we're going to be looking at three things that take place during the crucifixion, three things that I think we all need to recognize in this story to more fully appreciate what Jesus went through. And we're going to see them in chronological order because they all build off of one another. I think the best thing for us to do right now is to just read our story. Pilate, up to this point, has tried to pardon Jesus multiple times. And, and when he couldn't get the crowd to follow along with what he wanted to do, he basically washed his hands and said, you know what, I've done all I can. I tried. If anything happens after this, it's not my fault. Then he had Jesus flogged and taken away to be crucified. I'm going to pick up in Matthew 27, verse 27, and I'm going to read down to verse 35. You can follow along with me at home. It says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff on his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him and they took, excuse me, after they mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Then they had when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Actually, I want to jump down now to verse 45 through verse 53. 
Jesus is on the cross now, and it says, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. If you want to take notes as we... uh, Uh, talk about this passage in Matthew today, you can write a number one down on a sheet of paper and you can write these words next to it because the first thing we're going to talk about is the suffering of Jesus. The suffering of Jesus. That's the first thing that we have to talk about because it's the first thing that happens. We can't read everything that we just read and not understand that suffering is taking place here. And I'm not even talking about the spiritual suffering that we'll get to in a moment. I'm talking about the physical suffering that Jesus experienced during his crucifixion. And when I say that, I'm referencing every aspect of what happened from the flogging to the crown of thorns, carrying the cross. All of it is lumped together in this experience. Because everything about crucifixion was designed to be as humiliating and agonizing as possible. History tells us that when a man was sentenced to be crucified, he was stripped of his clothes and then paraded through the streets of the city so that everyone could see what was happening to him. He would have to carry somewhere between 50 and 200 pounds on his back, depending on whether or not he carried just the cross beam or the entire cross itself as he walked. Then his hands would be both tied and nailed to the cross beam and he would be lifted up on the cross. And in movies where we see the crucifixion of Jesus uh, portrayed, we usually see him uh, high up above the ground, you know, somewhere kind of suspended between heaven and earth. But that's not usually what happened. We have to remember that part of the punishment was humiliation. And so the cross was usually low, low enough so that people passing by could look a condemned man in the eye and mock him as he suffocated. Everything about this was cruel and unusual, and it commonly took days for those on a cross to die. And as we think about this, there's a very important, and I would even say in its own way, a very profound question that we have to ask when we read this story in the Gospels. And I believe that we ask it all the more when we look at uh, the history of crucifixion in Rome and when we understand more about the degrading details of what took place during a person's execution like this. And that important question is one word. Why? Why did Jesus go through this? If a person has gone to church for any length of time, they probably know what I would just call the correct answer. They know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And as horrible as that is in and of itself for him to have experienced, when we read it on paper, we can kind of see it as this noble act that he did. And of course, there is truth in that. But that's not the whole story, not the most complete picture of what Jesus went through. And just saying that Jesus died on the cross for our sins doesn't cover the trial in front of the religious and the Roman rulers at that time that turned into a riot where he was both spit on and struck by those around him. Just saying that Jesus died for our sins doesn't cover the flogging and the mocking and the weight of the cross on his back. And so I think it's appropriate for us to wonder why Jesus had to experience all of this. Because one of the things that we have made sure to point out time and again, especially as we we get closer to the finish line of Matthew's gospel, is the reality that God is in control. And so if we stress this truth that God is in control, then we ask, why did God allow this to happen? 
Christianity is the only religious faith where we see God himself truly crying out in suffering. Have you ever read, uh, excuse me, have you ever really thought about that? You know, when Jesus suffered, it meant that God suffered. God put himself in a place to be mocked and beaten and and spit on. Why would he do that? I'm going to ask a question right now. Whenever you're experiencing a difficult time in your life, maybe I, I just say it like this, whenever you're going through suffering, how does it make you feel? How valuable is it to talk with someone who has been there, to talk with someone who has gone through what you've gone through, to talk with someone who knows what it's like to suffer? I love to read. I love to listen to podcasts. I'm sure that many of you are the same as me. Now, one of the things that I love to read about and to listen about is, is history. I've always been a huge history buff. And because of that, I've listened to to hundreds of episodes, probably hundreds of hours uh, about things like the history of Rome and the French Revolution and all sorts of topics like that. And because of that, I can stand up here today and I can say, I know a lot about these things. And that's true. And there is some value in that, I believe. But you and I both know that's not the same thing as living those things as being there in the middle of it, as experiencing it, as surviving it. God doesn't know about suffering the way that we know about historical events. He knows suffering because he has suffered. And so when we suffer, he is there with us, and it's not at a distance, and it's not in some sort of academic way. But he is there as one who has suffered. He's known humiliation and pain and loss. He's known fear. I love the way that Hebrews 2 verse 18 reads in the New Living Translation. It says, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. It's easy for us to think about, you know, what Jesus went through and to feel gratitude because we know that he died on the cross for our sins. And while that's, you know, not the wrong answer to the question of why Jesus died and why all this happened, I don't believe it's the most complete answer. That's the way that I would phrase it. Because as if it weren't enough, he experienced so much more than just death, as strange as that might sound. And because that's a reality that I think we all need to understand, I want to talk about the second thing that we need to be aware of in our passage. So if you're uh, writing notes or taking notes, you can write it number two down. You can write the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of Jesus. I'm going to read from our passage again really quickly, verses 45 through 50. It says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So, what did Jesus sacrifice? I'm not trying to sound foolish when I ask that question, because I think it's vital for us to understand what's going on here. And I don't think it's wrong for us to talk about the first, maybe the most obvious thing that he sacrificed. We know that he sacrificed his life. But again, just like when we talked about and when we looked at the suffering of Jesus, we need to make sure that we understand everything going on. We need, to, we need to make sure that we see, rather, the whole picture of what is taking place here. And firstly, that means we need to understand that he gave up his spirit willingly. It was not taken from him. I mentioned earlier that when most people died on a cross, it took them days But that's not what happened to Jesus. He did not fade away over a period of time. And in fact, verse 46 in our text is is crucial uh, in showing us this. And it's not because of the words that Jesus says in that verse, but it's because of how he says them. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, in a loud voice, 
Well, why is that important? Well, because it shows us that he still had strength enough to do that. It shows us that he was still able, able to cry out in a loud voice. Not just some agonizing scream in pain, but a clear voice that could be heard, a voice that could be understood. Because of the way that the condemned were hung on the cross, it was excruciating just to breathe. And when a person died, it was usually from suffocation because he could no longer push the weight of his own body up to take a breath. But Jesus was not at that point. As beaten and battered as he was, he wasn't yet to the point where he was fighting for small pieces of air. He still had strength enough to cry out in a loud and clear voice words to his father. But here's the deal. That's the first thing we need to understand. This sacrifice that we're talking about, the death of Jesus, him willingly giving up his spirit was not the only sacrifice or even, I believe, the most important sacrifice he made that day. When we look at the rest of verse 46, I think we see this sacrifice. Because after we know that he cried out in a loud voice, we see what he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. One of the things that happened during the crucifixion of Jesus is that for three hours, while he hung on the cross, there was darkness. And it would be easy for us to try and explain away this event with the idea that maybe there was an eclipse or something like that. But the reality is that does not do justice to what is happening here. An eclipse, even a full eclipse, a total eclipse, does not create darkness for more than a few minutes. This was a supernatural darkness made by God. When we study scripture and we see darkness occur during the day, because this is not the only time that it takes place, we know that it's a sign of judgment, a sign of disapproval from God. And this leads us to the question, what made God so angry? What made God so angry? And again, I'm not trying to sound uh, careless or, or glib when I ask that. Because here's where we see the next sacrifice of Jesus. Because as terrible as it was, what people were doing to Jesus that day, God was not pouring out his judgment on them. He was pouring it out on his one and only son, his perfect son. On the cross, Jesus was forsaken by God. This, this love that Jesus had with his father, this love, this connection that was infinitely perfect and absolutely long was gone. You see, Jesus didn't just experience our death, the death that we should have died. He experienced our separation, our judgment, our abandonment. And he experienced all of that so that you and I would never have to. That was his sacrifice. And because of his sacrifice, we see the final piece of all of this fall into place. And you can write this down next to a number three. We see the success of Jesus. The success of Jesus. I'm just gonna read one verse from our passage because I think it only takes one verse in this passage to really highlight the success of Jesus. Verse 51 at that moment, the moment that Jesus gave up his spirit, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. What we need to understand is the word temple in that verse is not describing the temple building as a whole, but what it's describing is the inner sanctuary, what is called the Holy of Holies, where the symbolic presence of God dwelt. And this curtain separated that place from the rest of the temple. And in a very real sense, it protected everyone from the perfect presence of God. But when Jesus died, there was no longer a need for that curtain. There was no longer a need for that separation. And because God knew that the religious leaders who were in charge, they would not understand this reality and remove the curtain themselves, he did it. He did it. In John MacArthur's commentary on Matthew, we read these words. God was saying, in effect, in the death of my son, Jesus Christ, there is total access 
into my holy presence. That's what you and I have now. Total access into the holy presence of God. And I don't know about you, but I would say that that is a success. This means that anyone, and I mean anyone who believes in him, believes in Jesus, can connect with God, can know God, and can have God dwelling inside of him or her. There doesn't have to be any more separation, no more being left out, no more being apart from God. We have access to God in a way that others before us only dreamed of. The God whose presence was so powerful and holy that it could kill those that came into contact with it. His presence now can live inside of us through his Holy Spirit. It's an incredible thing for us to, to think about and to consider when we think about what this means for our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the success that Jesus' death on the cross gave us. That's the, the opportunity that you and I now have in our lives. And as wonderful as this is, and I'm about done, I do want to circle back before we close because I'm talking about, you know, what Jesus experienced as he went through the crucifixion but I want to pause before we wrap things up and look at something that I talked about in the beginning, because here's the deal. It's impossible for us to read about what Jesus went through on the cross and, and not take comfort in the knowledge that we know a few days later, he rises from the grave. But his followers, even with all that he had told them, they did not realize that. They did not comprehend that. They did not understand what was happening when a supernatural darkness covered the land for three hours. They didn't see the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. All they saw, all that the followers of Jesus saw in that moment was a senseless act of cruelty and violence. They saw an act of suffering with no silver lining of any kind. Now, over time, they came to understand the death of Jesus in the same way that you and I can understand the death of Jesus. And that means where once they saw something that was a, a monumental defeat in their lives, uh, eventually they understood it as the single greatest act of love and power and justice and victory in history. Like I said, I didn't talk much about the people surrounding Jesus during his crucifixion because we're going to do that next week. But at one point, the religious leaders, they're just taunting Jesus. And in verse 42 of Matthew 27, they say, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Now, I don't believe that for a second. But the reality is what you and I know today is the truth that because Jesus stayed on the cross, because he did not come down, that's what shows us that he was and is God. But remember, at that moment, for the followers of Jesus, all hope was lost. And this is something, as I mentioned before in the introduction, this is something that we lose sight of because we're so familiar with the gospel story. But in this moment in history for the followers of Jesus, even after everything that had happened, everything they had seen, everything they had taught, even in some cases, everything they themselves had done, they didn't know what to believe anymore. And they felt lost and alone and confused. Why am I talking to you about this? Because all of us, on one level or another, know what it's like to suffer and to feel lost and alone and confused. Some of us are probably feeling that right now. Some of us may be thinking that everything we're going through is just meaningless, senseless. One of my favorite authors to read is a pastor named Timothy Keller. He lives in New York City. And whenever he writes about suffering... He talks about the fact that people always want an answer to that question, why? That question we talked about a little bit already today. He says that we don't always know the why. He says that people want to know what the reason is 
for their suffering or even someone else's suffering. And while we don't always have an answer, he says that the cross is actually a wonderful thing because it tells us not so much what the reason is for our suffering, but it reminds us of what it is not, what it can't mean. He says, when we suffer, it can't be because God doesn't love you. It can't be that he has no plan for you. It can't be that he has abandoned you. Jesus was abandoned and paid for our sins so that God the Father would never abandon you. The cross proves that he loves you and understands what it means to suffer. It also demonstrates that God can be working in your life even when it seems like there is no rhyme or reason to what is happening. Last week we ended with a challenge not to give up on ourselves and not to give up on God. Well, I think it's a fitting way for us to end our time together today as well. No matter what you're going through right now, and no matter how much of it makes sense to you in this moment, remember that God is right there with you. No matter what happens, don't give up on God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what we read about and what we learn about when we study the crucifixion of Jesus. Thank you for the fact that we know you are right there with us in our suffering. Thank you for the love and the mercy that you now pour out onto our lives because of what Jesus experienced when he was forsaken, when he was lost and alone on the cross. Help us to never lose sight of that. Help us to be reminded and encouraged every day by your love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.